It's Miss Meyer for another episode of the Miss Meyer Show. And today, what we're going to be talking about is or are reform movements. <laughs> It's rain and tacos from out of the sky. Okay, so um, the reform movements is how things were changing. Lots of big things were happening in the United States. Um, you know, after, well, really before the Civil War got really started in the early 1800s and things like that, things were changing. And it just wasn't, you know, North versus South. It was all kinds of things. It was the abolitionist movement, the women's movement, the movement for education, healthcare reform, mental illness stability. All of these things were happening and kind of snowballing up until the Civil War. So the first thing that we're going to talk about, we're going to make two videos because one is just going to take forever. So it's going to be two videos. The first we're going to talk about are developments in the abolitionist movement. Now what an abolitionist is, an abolitionist is someone who was anti-slavery, wanted to get rid of it. And a really important thing to remember is not every single Southerner or not every single person that lived in Louisiana was for slavery. You had a lot of people in Louisiana, a lot of people in the South that were totally against slavery and the institution of it and wanted it to be gone. However, the big forces that were really relied on it, especially in the South where we relied on agricultural production to make our money. So, uh, sorry guys, hold on. <clears throat> Hello? Hey, what's they say? There we go. Okay, so the northern states abolish slavery. They are the first ones to really get rid of it. So during the American Revolution, many people began to question the institution of slavery. The colonists wondered how they could be fighting for their freedom from the British while the African Americans were still being held as slaves. So following the victory in the Revolution, the northern states began to abolish slavery, get rid of it little by little. It wasn't just a whole general get rid of everything. It was a gradual removal. So between 1790 and 1804, all of the states of the North passed Emancipation Acts. Emancipation is basically getting rid of first slavery, abolishing it, getting rid of it. The first states to abolish slavery were Rhode Island and Vermont. The Quakers were a group of people, they also called themselves the Society of Friends, and they were strongly opposed to slavery. The Quakers were strongly opposed to violence. Um, many Quakers, they worked in the abolitionist movement and later worked actually with the Underground Railroad during the 1800s in the, the aiding slaves to come to freedom. That's what the Underground Railroad was. We'll talk more about that when we talk about Harriet Tubman. The La Amistad was a Spanish ship, and this was actually a movie that I drug my husband to see when we were dating many, many years ago in like 1998, or I think that was, I think it was around that time. And he was like, this is, this is the most boring movie ever. That was until I drug him to go see Les Miserables. So, um, and what it is, it's, this is a true story. And like, I'm going from boom, boom, boom. I'm just going one on top of the other. And I'm doing like, abolitionist movement. So we talked about the Quakers. Now we're going to talk about a ship called the La Amistad. And this was a Spanish ship that was transporting African slaves to Cuba. Well, the slaves took control of the ship and they were trying to sail back to Africa. But instead, the ship was captured by the U.S. Navy and was taken to Connecticut. So the slaves on the ship were um, went through a court case and it followed and it went all the way to the Supreme Court. In 1841, the court ruled that the Africans should be considered free men. Um, at this time, the Atlantic slave trade was illegal and therefore it was illegal to bring slaves from Africa to the Americas. 
So the triangle trade of slavery that was once so profitable in the United States at this time of the La Amistad was illegal. And the slaves that revolted, took control of the ship, were granted their freedom. And this was a landmark, I mean like total landmark case. And the Supreme Court granted them that freedom because, because it was against the law to do any type of slave trading, Atlantic slave trading from you know, uh, you know, uh, the African slaves to the the Americas, um, and it was like a big, big deal. The next thing that was huge with the abolitionist movement was a book. Never underestimate the power of reading. Um, really, books have the you know, immense power to change lives. When Hitler was ruling, when we go to Washington, you'll see when we go to the um, the Holocaust Museum, there's a huge section called banned books. Hitler banned a ton of books because of the power that reading can do. When you read, your brain grows. Your brain, you know how when you, watch these muscles, y'all. Whoa! Wow! I'm a, I'm a beast. But, you know, your brain is a muscle, too. And when you read, your brain grows. Um, it's true. Well, a book at this time had amazing power. This is before internet. This is before Twitter and Facebook. Although I don't even use Twitter. I don't know anybody who uses Twitter. Um, or Instagram. My daughter's the only one. She, she set me up an Instagram account. I have nothing on it. Um, <laughs> but um, or what I, the only things I have on is what she put on there. This is before this. This is before Yahoo and YouTube and the, the 10 o'clock news and all this kinds of stuff. So people really didn't have access to insider information. You know, like today, if you want to see, like, uh, I don't know, you want to go inside, like, the Vatican. That's something that I'm really interested in. I'm always trying to, like, I want to go and look inside. I go to YouTube and type in inside the Vatican. Can't do that. Couldn't do that at this time. This book, written by Harriet Beecher Stowe, shed a light on slavery. The book was called Uncle Tom's Cabin. Cabin. Okay, and it was published in 1852. And what this book did was that it highlighted the, to the terror and the horror that was slavery. People had no idea of what it was really like. You know, the, you, you didn't know because you didn't, you didn't experience it. There wasn't anybody on, you know, Inside Edition or YouTube telling you about it with hidden cameras and stuff like that. People didn't know. When this book came out, People were outraged because it was a first person glimpse into what it looked like, what slavery looked like. This novel became an instant bestseller and it caused many people to emphasize with the slaves and to join the anti-slavery movement. Y'all know that I am a vegan or pretty much a vegan. I've had a little mix up with the ice cream. I couldn't handle it. The chocolate, uh, the cookies and cream ice cream was calling my name and I I had to I had to eat some. It was it was a bad day. <laughs> it was I'm mostly a vegan. And what made me what brought me to that was when I read a book about um, factory farming and animals and athletes and things like that. And it changed my mind. It really brought, it, it made me understand what it was to be a vegan and what, you know, animal rights and what the animal products were doing to my body and things like that. So just like my eyes were opened to being a vegan and to not having animal products, the same thing was going on with Uncle Tom's Cabin in relationship to slavery. These people had no idea. A lot of them had no clue what was going on. Just like I had no idea about how the majority of animals were slaughtered for uh, consumption or dairy animals. I had no idea about that. But once I learned about it, things changed. So the same thing was going on with this book. People read it and they were just like, Oh my gosh, I can't, I can't imagine that that actually happens. It just blows me away. And they really were able to join the anti-slavery movement. Reading changes your life. 
It does. It increases your vocabulary. It enhances your cognitive skills. It does so many things that you, it, it, it's just amazing. It's amazing. And if you want to read an, a totally amazing book, I highly suggest Gone with the Wind. It is the greatest book ever. I love it. I read it at least once a year. It, it, it is really a really good book. Okay, so now we're going to talk about famous abolitionists. That's a really fun word to say, abolitionists. I just like saying it. All right, so the first one we're going to talk about is a guy named Frederick Douglass. And in fact, that's him. Hi, Frederick. How are you? Hello, boys and girls. My name is Frederick Douglass, and this is my story. Oh, I really love Frederick Douglass. He was extremely, extremely important during in our history in american history so frederick douglas was born a slave in maryland and what was amazing about him is just how you know what he had done how far he had come he escaped in his slavery in 1838 and he went to massachusetts so he published his autobiography and called it the narrative of the life of frederick douglas an american slave in 1845 so people are starting to wake up and realize what is going on with slavery whereas before people had no clue they were like what i don't know i don't know anything about that now they were beginning to understand what it was like he was a great speaker. And you need to remember that it was illegal to teach uh, slaves how to read and write. So Fred, in order for Frederick Douglass to have done these things, he was a great orator. He was a great speaker. He was a great presenter. Someone you know, hmm, might be a great speaker. Or <laughs> Okay. So he was a great speaker, and he gave many speeches about his experience as a slave. He, so, like, totally packed the houses were listening to him. Because, like I said before, people did not know about slavery. I mean, they knew slavery. They honestly knew, you know, and they saw some of the atrocities. But they didn't know how it really went down inside of slavery. Like, okay, I could go up to anybody... And, well, anybody can come up to me and they can say, oh, I saw all the terrible things about Hurricane Katrina on the news. I saw that. I lived it. I lived it firsthand. So I could tell you firsthand how it was. Yeah, you saw a little bit of it. You seen that it wasn't so, it was how it was on the news and on CNN, but I experienced it. So I can tell you my firsthand account. Listening to me is going to be, much better, I would think, than just sitting listening to like Anderson Cooper report on it because I was there. So people were, you know, yeah, they knew about slavery and they understood what the whole process was, but to listen to Frederick Douglass, to read Uncle Tom's Cabin, that was a way of experiencing it firsthand and that was just amazingly clear to them. Um, Grimke sisters, the two Grimke sisters, their, same, their names were Angelina and Sela Grimke, and they grew up in the slave-owning family in South Carolina. So, and like I, I told you guys before, not everyone in the South owned slaves. You had to be really rich to own slaves. Uh, and most families, when they owned slaves, only owned like maybe one or two. To have like this huge plantation like Scarlett O'Hara and Gone with the Wind, that was very few people. So, but the Grimms, the Grimke sisters, they grew up in a big slave-owning family. They saw firsthand, a witness firsthand, how cruel slave owners were to their slaves. The sisters moved to Philadelphia, and they started to speak out against slavery. Um, they joined the Quakers, and like I said, they were all the Quakers were called, you know, the the the. Fam the Society of Friends, and they were Christians. They used the Bible in a lot of their arguments against slavery. And um, that really transmitted to a lot of people. A lot of people started to listen to them. What makes them also pretty cool is that they were women. And at this time, women did not have the right to vote. They were, as well, viewed as property of their husbands and fathers and brothers. So for these women to go out and speak out against something was a really courageous and really brave. Nat Turner is another one. Actually, there was a Nat Turner puppet. But I didn't get him because I'd already bought like five of them. No, I bought one, two, three, I bought four puppets. They were like 
10 15 dollars a piece for these little guys the big ones the big um albert einstein and marilyn monroe were 20 dollars so i didn't get the nat turner puppet because my husband was like what is all these toys that you're buying well anyways nat turner was excuse me nat turner let me go back was a slave from Virginia, and in 1831, he led a violent slave re rebellion, which resulted in the deaths of over 50 white people, including Turner's owner. So this was a big slave rebellion. Turn, uh, Nat Turner was able to say, you know, enough is enough. We are not going to let this happen anymore. We are going to stand up and we're going to fight. We're tired of being treated as property. Remember, we um, listened to, uh, I think it, was, it wasn't it was Uncle Bob led better. It was, it was the other lady. And she had said that they were treated pretty much like, like animals. One slave owner didn't even think that they needed to feed them. And Nat Turner led a rebellion. Lots of people were killed, including Nat Turner's owner. Uh, several months later, after the rebellion in 1831, Nat Turner was caught, he was brought to trial, and he was convicted for his role in the revolt. In, on November 11th, um, uh, in 1831, in response to this, he was hanged and he was killed. Um, but what this did was that this opened people's eyes once again and saw that people were willing to risk their lives, to die violent deaths, to, you know, to bring light to what was going on. During the South at this time period, um, what had happened because of the rebellion, a lot of Southern states toughened up what they called slave codes. And it was basically slave laws. And this was a law on what they would allow slaves to do and what they were not allowed to do and all these other kinds of things. One of the slave codes that they toughened up during this time was the prohibition of slaves and them learning, not learning to read. They wouldn't teach the slaves how to read. This is it. This is when it made it truly illegal to teach them how to read and write. Because they wanted to control them. They didn't want them to be able to read things, to, you know, go and do those kinds of things. Dred Scott um, was a slave whose master had been taking him to live into areas where slavery was prohibited. So let me go back in case that makes no sense. Dred Scott was yet another slave. We've talked about three slaves so far. We talked about Frederick Douglass. We talked about Nat Turner. Now we're talking about Dred Scott. There's three different names that are very, very, very important. Dred Scott was a slave. Now his master, a slave in the South, was basically property. Just like I own this iPad here, and I have it in this real tough outer box case because Vivian, even though she has her own, throws it the other day she threw it out of the car but we were parked thank goodness and the van door opens automatically it just opens so vivian took the ipad she was all mad i don't remember why and she threw it into the grass but thank goodness it's got this nice hard cover on it but anyways just like this ipad is my property that's how they a lot of the southern a lot of them these southern slave owners viewed their slaves. It was their property. Well, Dred Scott's owner took him to live in an area where slavery had been prohibited, where there was no slavery. And this was about in 1845, 1846. So with the help of the anti-slavery lawyers, Scott went and sued for his freedom because he said, hey, slavery is not allowed in this state. Therefore, I'm free. You brought me here. I'm free. Well... So he sued for his freedom on the grounds that where he lived now his residence was now in a free state and in this free state he was now considered to be a free man well in 1857 the dred scott versus stanford case went all the way to the supreme court remember guys the supreme court does not hear cases that have to do with criminal activity the whole okay bring her down <sighs> The only kind of cases that the Supreme Court hears are cases that have to do with the Constitution. Is this against the Constitution? Okay? So, when this case went to the Supreme Court, the, the um, they basically said, this is what they had told them. The court ruled 
that Congress did not have the authority to prohibit slavery in territories. Therefore, the Missouri Compromise was unconstitutional. Also, the court ruled that slaves were not citizens and therefore they did not have the right to view. So the Supreme Court of the United States stated that slaves were not citizens and they did not have the legal rights of your general American public. Um, it also said that, you know, uh, living in a territory, it did not have the authority to say that no slaves were there. Now, America was just getting big. I mean, we had just, you know, gotten a bunch of land in the Louisiana Purchase not too long ago. And they were saying that you, in order to become a state, you had to have a... Hi. Hi. What you got? Shoes. You got some shoes? Uh -huh. These are my shoes. She's got shoes. How many shoes do you have? Shoes. Uh, How many shoes do you have? Eight and nine. One? Two. One? Two. two. Three. Three. That's right. So they had, um, in order to be recognized as a state, you had to have a certain amount of people living in an area. Well, until you had that certain amount of people, you were considered to have been living in a territory. Well, that's where Nat Turner was. He was at a territory. He was taken to a territory. Now, even though... Thank you. Please. <laughs> okay, I'm trying to move her out of the frame. Okay, so... Um, they were saying that because that, that Nat Turner was taken to a territory and not to a state, that territory did not have the actual ability to say slavery is not allowed here because they just did not have enough people to be recognized as a state yet. But on top of that, they also said that Nat Turner had no right to sue for his freedom because he wasn't even considered a citizen, which was pretty intense. Harriet Tubman is the next one we're going to talk about. And that, where's, <laughs> all right. So Harriet Tubman, that's her right here. Hello, boys and girls. My name is Harriet Tubman. I don't know if she had a southern accent. I'm just going to say that she had a southern accent because that's my interpretation of her. So Harriet Tubman was an escaped slave. So we learned about a bunch of slaves. We learned about Nat Turner, Dred Scott, Frederick Douglass, and now Harriet Tubman. These are all people that you should know about. Although I guarantee my mom has no idea who they are. Not one. Uh, I can guarantee you that. She has no clue. Um, Harriet Tubman was an escaped slave who helped other slaves escape on the Underground Railroad. They, um, she was called the conductor of the Underground Railroad and helped many, many slaves escape to freedom. She risked her life a, a huge amount of times. She, uh, the Underground Railroad, which is really important. When, remember when I first started teaching, I was going to school to be a teacher at UNO. Go privateers! Woohoo! And um, I had to go and teach a lesson. It was like teacher training or whatever at this little elementary school. And I wanted to teach history, you know? And so I went and I was talking to little kids about the Underground Railroad. They were like, is it a real railroad? Is it really underground? And I was like, no, you know, and I was like, I never want to teach little kids. <laughs> like, was it not? It was not for me, okay? I was like, I can't teach these kids. Oh, my gosh. All right, but anyway, so the Underground Railroad was a network of people and homes that where escaped slaves could go. Now, one of the things that I used to love to do when I taught at a brick-and-mortar school, we would have an Underground Railroad experience. And what we would do is that we, uh, where my classroom was on a huge long hallway, I mean like major, length of a football field hallway. And we would, put, I would be like Harriet Tubman and my class would be like, you know, the slaves trying to go to their freedom. Well, my class, we started, the, I was like at the very end of one hallway. So we would start on my class, at my class door and try to get all the way to the other side without anybody seeing us. We would do it in between classes, you know, when, I mean, while classes were going on, so people were still in the classes. And we would have to hide so people couldn't see us. And, I mean, the kids thought it was great fun, but it really showed them how, how scary it was to not be seen, you know, or try to get there. Because if they were caught, 
they were going to be hanged. And it didn't matter if you had your baby with you or your old grandma, you know, or grandpa trailing along. They were going to get to kill you all. So it was a really, really dangerous thing. And they would travel at night and they would go into different homes to hide out during the day to get to freedom. Now, Harriet Tubman was the conductor. She led these people. And she helped lead all these slaves to freedom. She made 19 trips, y'all, to the South and helped over 300 people escape. Now, Harriet Tubman was not this big, brawly, you know, um, I don't know if y'all, a lot of you read the books of Game of Thrones, but there's like this character called Brienne of Tarth, and she's like just massive, like, ah! Harriet Tubman was not like that. She was kind of, she was tiny. She was, you know, kind of petite, and she showed extreme courage. And that goes to show you, you don't have to be this massive beast of a person to be courageous and to stand up for what is right. You know, sometimes it's the smallest person. Look at Gandhi. He was tiny. Okay, look at Mother Teresa. It's another person. It was itty bitty. Extreme courage. Extreme courage. Okay. Sojourn your truth. I love Sojourn your truth. And let me tell you why. One of my favorite things that I like about Sojourn your truth. My oldest daughter's name is Isabel. Well, this is before Vivian came into the picture. This is uh Mr. Meyer. And that's Isabel. And that's oops, that's Katie. Look at Isabel, how cute she is. All right. So one of the reasons that I absolutely love um, Sojourn Your Truth is that her real name was Isabella. Isabella, which was supposed to be Belle's name. I wanted to name her Isabella, but my husband was totally yeah, against it. Maybe. She's a baby still. But anyways, so Sojourn Your Truth's name was Isabella. And I really think that's just a beautiful name because that was what I wanted to name my baby. But we chose Isabel whatever um so sojourn your truth she changed her name when she was born she was born a slave and her name was isabella but she decided that stop when she gained her freedom she decided to change her name and she changed her name to sojourn your truth she traveled as a speaker and was extremely influential in both the abolitionist movement and the women's rights movement, which was phenomenal because not only was Sojourn Your Truth an African-American, a former slave, she was also a woman. And at this point in time, women were not listened to. They were not given the right to vote. They were not able to own property. None of those things. And Sojourn Your Truth not only spoke out against the atrocities of slavery, but she also spoke out on the equality of women. And one of the problems was is that Sojourn Your Truth did not find a companionship with other women trying to do the same thing. Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Susan B. Anthony, none of them wanted to really give Sojourn Your Truth the same you know, rights and the opportunities that they had because she was a former slave. So talk about courage. That's Sojourn Your Truth. Her Ain't I a Woman speech is probably one of the most heart-wrenching speeches that she's ever given, and I'm going to attach it to this video. Um, John Brown. This is another one. A lot of people talk about John Brown. Oh, I have it. Vivian's home today, guys, because she's got a fever, believe it or not, and um, that's why she's sitting around going, no, 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 no. and I've got to film this for you guys, so that's why you hear in the background. I do apologize. I do. I'm sorry, but... I need to send this to you guys, and I have nowhere else to put her. I put her upstairs. She's screaming. I keep her down here. She's literally hanging on the TV. Like, literally. This is what she's doing. This is Vivian. Okay. Yeah, that's what she's... That, that's... that's. Hi. Hi. Okay, why don't you... Brown was an abolitionist. Oh, my gosh, y'all. If I ever show and do a video where I actually have makeup on and have my hair fixed... You guys wouldn't even know who I was. You'd be like, who's that teacher? Okay, so John Brown was an abolitionist. He led a raid on a place called Harper's Ferry. Now, Harper's Ferry, Virginia, basically. And what he did... Go get your baby. The baby's crying. So he read, led this raid to Harper's Ferry... And he basically stole lots of weapons. And he gave them to the slaves. So he hoped that by arming the slaves, he would be able to have them start a rebellion to gain their freedom. So, 
John, John Brown, he thought that by giving the slaves weapons that he would be able to start a re they would be able to start a rebellion and gain their freedom. Shortly after the raid, John Brown was captured and he was executed. Now, slave owners feared that after Nate Turner's rebellion, after the Underground Railroad, after John Brown's raid on Harper's Ferry, there would be even more slave rebellions. So they were really fearful that this kind of, um, you know, rebellions were going to continue. William Lloyd Garrison was an avid abolitionist. So he started an abolitionist newspaper called The Liberator in the 1830s. Garrison called for the immediate emancipation of all slaves throughout the entire country. And in 1833, he started the American Anti-Slavery Society with other abolitionists. In fact, Garrison referred to the Constitution of the United States as a covenant with death because it did not prohibit slavery. They said, what kind of constitution is it? You're saying that all men are created equal. Life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness, justice for all, but not if you're a slave? That doesn't make any sense. So that's what was really important about him. Go see, Vivi, go draw. Free African Americans. So in the Northeast, African Americans were mostly freed slaves. Though some had come to the Americas free, the majority of them were former slaves. They worked in the North in many different parts of society. As they gained, as no, as they gained numbers, many African American schools and churches were started. This became meeting places where African Americans would come to discuss their rights, slavery in the South, maybe getting their family out, how to advance the abolitionist cause, and how to increase the rights of African Americans in the United States. Because just because these African Americans were now in the northern part of the United States and now had more freedoms and were no longer slaves, they weren't exactly equal to that those as, you know, the other free white American citizens. <sighs> Whew, I apologize for Vivian. <laughs> she's got a bad cold, my poor baby, and she's so whiny and I know. All right, so, and Kate's sick too. Okay, so women's rights movement. That's the next thing that we're going to talk about. Now, the women's rights movement was something that was just big at the time as well. Women at this time did not have the ability to vote or a lot of women did not have the ability to own property and they were pretty much viewed as their husband's property as well. Well, during this time of reform, we see some really big names in the women's reform movement coming around. Now, one of the names of the women of this time was Susan B. Anthony, and she's probably the most well-known advocate of women's rights. She started, started the organization for equal pay as a teen school teacher. Long time ago, during you know the 1850s, in order to be a school teacher, you didn't have to have years and years of college training like we do today, um, you just really had to kind of take a couple of courses and finish school yourself. So when she was a teenager, she was a school teacher and she wasn't getting paid the same as men. And she didn't think that was fair. So she started organizing people and talking about what's going on and using her voice. Because that's what you have. If you never speak out of injustice and things that are not, you know, going right, then things can't get fixed. So use your voice, use your ability. Now, she, uh, in, the, in the 1850s, she became a national leader for women's suffrage, which is the right to vote. She traveled as a speaker throughout the United States and Europe, and she even wrote a book about the women's suffrage movement, and she, you know, she fought for women's rights. Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Lucretia Mott are two other big names that we always hear about. Um, they were originally abolitionists. Uh, they were against slavery, and they did not like at all slavery of having any person not valued as the same or people being equal. And eventually, they changed. I mean, not changed, but they added to their reform movements the plight of women, women's suffrage. Well, the story is that they originally attended an anti-slavery conference in London in 18 and 1840, 
Well, when they were there, they saw that they were treated differently than the men that were at this convention. And they did not like that one bit. They were angry about this. So they started to work together for women's rights. They wanted to work together for, you know, to, for women to have the ability to be in government, to vote, to own property, to have businesses, to do things other than being a teacher or a nurse and to have jobs and do all these kinds of things. They were not very, I mean, the majority of people at this time did not like this idea. And these women were victimized and they were vilified, especially by, you know, the elite gentlemen of the world. They were organizers of the women, first women's rights convention in Seneca Falls, New York. And what they did there was they spoke about the rights of women, that women should be valued the same as men and we should definitely have the same rights so this was also a big thing in the reform movement now the Seneca Falls convention was organized and run by Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Lucretia Mott and it was among us some other women that were there but those were the two big names at the time the Seneca Falls convention was a women's rights convention that took place like I said in Seneca Falls New York in 1848 attendees of the convention signed they even had like their own declaration of independence and they called it the declaration of sentiments now this was a document that was modeled after the declaration of independence but it was given it was to list just like the declaration of independence listed our grievances against great britain the declaration of sentiments listed our grievances that women had fewer rights than men and the women there signed it and they were going to present their plight that they were going to say we are no longer going to deal with this okay let's see i want to see if i can go to the next one okay let's just keep going so education is the next thing that oh, we're going to talk about i was initially going to make this into two videos but i think i have enough time to make it into one long one i'm sorry i'm sorry ah! Okay, well, in the early 1800s, we're just going to go through this a little quickly. Okay, so in the early 1800s, and I'm just going to move this over here, few American children had access to public school educations, free educations. You know, the, parents had kids and they helped out on the farm. They helped out in the household. Girls cooked and cleaned, took care of younger siblings. Boys went out in the fields, did all kinds of things like that. Communities had land set aside to build a school, but they could not collect enough taxes to pay for them. American reformer Horace Mann, however, he believed that education reform could bring about social change. Just like I said, when you read, your brain grows. When you learn about something new, your brain grows. So Horace Mann believed that public education should be available to all children, no matter what. No matter how much money your family makes, no matter if you're, you know, born poor or you're born in a mansion, you should have the same right and ability to receive an education. So he, uh, so in 13, 1837, Mann became the Secretary of Education in Massachusetts, and he started working to implement new education reforms. Now, as a result of Mann's efforts, Public education became increasingly available throughout the country and allowed for a lot more students to attend school. And um, as a poor girl growing up in, you know, Chalmette, Louisiana, uh, I, you know, I, I, thanks to Horace Mann, you know, many, many years later, not nowhere near was born in the 1830s, you know, all these kids had access to an education, whereas some people who lived in rural Louisiana would have never, ever, been able to send their children to school. So because of Horace Mann, you, he was a big reformer. I mean, there were many people who helped, but Horace Mann was one of the big reformer names. The next thing we're going to talk about are prisons and mental institutions, okay? In a mental institution, and this was a lot of people, um, mentally ill people were, uh, in order, excuse me, in order for a person to be considered mentally ill, there were lots of things that consisted, c constituted as being mentally ill. If a woman fought with her husband every day, y'all remember how I told you guys about the dead bird? There was a dead bird by my garbage can, and I kept telling my husband, you need to get rid of it. Please get rid of it. Please get rid of it, because it flies are everywhere. I mean, I must have nagged him about this. Ugh, I don't even know. It's ridiculous. I'm probably nagging him about the dead bird as much as I'm, well, it's gone. 
probably because an animal ate it. I don't know. I do live in Texas. Um, there's a light over my stove that burnt out. I really want him to get it fixed. And I keep bugging him. Don't, get, don't forget to get the light fixed. Don't forget to get the light fixed. Because you have to, the screw broke, I mean, the light bulb broke in, broke off in the holder. So in order to get it out, I don't know, you have to use pliers or something. And I'm afraid to do it because I don't want to electrocute myself because I've already electrocuted myself once. And it was not fun. So I'm going to let him electrocute himself. But I keep nagging him about it on and on and on. Well, in the 1830s, if a wife nagged her husband consistently about something, he could put her in a mental institution and say she was crazy. Which I'm sure my husband would have put me in a long time ago. But seriously. So in the United States, the mentally ill people were pretty much the poor people. They lived in jails. They lived in poor houses. There wasn't like, you know, they weren't people that they were trying to help people. For a period of time in my life, actually for my first, wow, I think first year of college, I wanted to be a psychiatrist. I did. I, I, I did. I was like, I'm going to be a psychiatrist. Because I really wanted to be a teacher, but my parents were like, you don't want to be a teacher. And I was like, I really do. And they're like, well, why don't you? Uh, well, yeah. So I decided I'm going to be a psychiatrist instead. Well, obviously, I changed my mind, right? <laughs> Lucky you! No, but um, in today's society, you want to help people. Mental health is very important. And I always tell my kids, you know, like I say, oh, that person, what's wrong with them and blah, blah, blah. And I'll say, you know, just because some, you can't see an illness that someone has, it doesn't mean that they don't have it. So in today's day and age, yes, people are always trying to, you know, you want to help people who need that assistance, people that do have mental health issues. Um, but back then in the 1830s, they were pretty much thrown in there and throw away and lock the key. I mean, the treatment was horrible. The food was just unbelievable. They were treated inhumanely and abused and just really horrible things. Well, in the 1830s, a woman named Dorothea Dix, she visited jails and poorhouses to see how these mentally ill people were treated. She found that many of these patients were treated like criminals. Some of them were kept in cages where they lived in their own feces. No baths, hair growing everywhere, just total horrible conditions. So she began to work and advocate and to reform mental institutions so that these patients would be treated in more humane ways, that they still receive the dignity of a human life. She also worked to get the government to build federally or state-funded asylums or places for these people. Just because a person has an illness that happens to be unseen, such as a mental illness, bipolar disorder, anxiety, OCD, ADD, ADHD, even that's considered, I don't even know what they consider that anymore. My daughter has ADHD and I read a book about it and one book was like, oh, they used to classify it as a mental disorder. I'm like, what? Um, I don't know, but uh, you know those kinds of people that have these these you know uh, I don't even want to say disabilities because it's really not a disability. It's different functioning of your brain. You're still a human being. You're still an American citizen, and you should still have rights. And Dorothea Dix is someone who really advocated for that. Religion, another big thing that was changing, and lots of reform going on at this time too. Well. In the 1800s, a period happened that came about called the Second Great Awakening. And this, during this time, we saw an increased participation in religion in the United States. Religious leaders, they traveled all over the country and they gave sermons to large groups of people. Now, these religious events were often held outdoors and they were called revivals. One important result of the Second Great Awakening was the introduction of many new Protestant denominations. At this time, the biggest denomination in the United States at this time was Roman Catholicism. With the, great Second, the Second Great Awakening, we start to see many other religions and denominations, not religions, but excuse me, denominations come into play. Um, this movement emphasized a personal relationship with God as opposed to more of the scientific thoughts of the Enlightenment thinkers. 
The religious ideas of the time period came to be extremely influential in the time of the reform reform movements, where they started to view everyone as the same, love everyone, love one another. That was a big thing that we started to see because we're starting to see women fighting for the rights, abolition of slavery, you know, the how the the treatment of the poor, the treatment of the ill, education for all people. So the Second Great Awakening was a good key thing in this because it really a lot of people were saying we are all equal. We should all have equal rights and responsibilities. Another thing that really was big with the Second Great Reform was the temperance movement. That's beautiful. She drew me a picture. I think it was of a line. It's one line, but it's a very beautiful drawing. Art is subjective, you know, whatever. My version of art and yours may be very different. Apparently, Vivian's is a lot. Well, the temperance movement was also really big during the Second Great Awakening, and that's where they wanted to stop all the drinking. They saw that lots of alcohol consumption was just making people go crazy, and they wanted to really end it. Oh, can I show everybody? Look at her picture, everybody. <gasps> what is that? What is it? It's a car. It's a what? It's a, it's a car? Oh, that's a beautiful car. Well, the temperance movement was another thing that was happened because of the Second Great Awakening. The next thing was that it caused lots of tension between the Protestants and the Catholics. Roman Catholicism, like I said, was the big main religion. And as more, or denomination, excuse me, as more Catholics began immigrating to the United States, some people in the United States began to grow concerned. Some people believe that Catholics could never be a good American citizen because they were first loyal to the Pope in Rome. Many Americans came to believe that Catholics were the cause of some of the society's problems in the U.S. So there was a lot. This is a new picture. What's this? What is this? Car. Another car? Wow. Go draw me a flower. Okay. Um, and they said that, you know, a lot of these people coming from Italy, that were having a lot of Catholics, were coming with, you know, the mafia connections and so forth like that. So they did say that they were a cause of lots of problems and they weren't but you know that's prejudice transcends transcendentalism wait transcendentalism transcendentalism i'm saying it wrong trans transcendentalism say that three times fast uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson and Henry David Thoreau were both well known for their participation in transcendentalism. And this was a 19th century literary, political, and philosophical movement. That's beautiful. So it started as a group of new ideas that began as a protest of general culture of society at the time. They were kind of like rebels, you know, like, you know, down with the government and those kinds of things. Um, at the core of their beliefs was an ideal in a spiritual state that transcends the physical and the observational world and is only realized by, through the individual's intuition. Basically like Vivian, she's showing me this art, right? Um, that's cars, it's really a bunch of squiggly lines. But to her, that's cars. Those are ca pictures of cars. That's transcendentationalism. That's her own interpretation of it. Well, while Waldo Emerson and Henry David Thoreau were two big advocates of this, being basically that your, your reality is whatever you experience it to be. You know, that was during this time. So you got lots of big innovative things going on during this time. The Temperance, like I had stated before, this was formed in 1826, the American Temperance Society, and they wanted to reduce Americans' consumption of alcohol. This was not, as you can imagine, did not go over well in New Orleans. People in the temperance movement blame society, social problems like crime and poverty and abuse on alcohol. Members of the society pledged not to drink any alcohol. The Women's Christian Temperance Union is one organization that was formed during this time. One of its leaders, Carrie Nation, was a, kind of a crazy person and carried a hatchet and would go into bars and stuff and start like hatcheting and breaking all the bottles like ah! it's for real so i mean 
They sought the same goals as the American Temperance Society, but they were a little bit more aggressive. Utopian societies. Um, Y'all know, like, I'm a vegan, and I'm, like, a crunchy kind of person. When Vivian was a baby, she wore cloth diapers, and I still don't, I like natural products and all these other kinds of things. I don't like different medicines, and I, I'm, I'm, like, a weird person. So my mom always says, you might as well live in some hippie commune. She always tells me that. And I'm like, oh, mom, you know, whatever. But that is not something that's new. That has been around for quite a while. Various utopian societies, they emerged during the 1800s. Now, a group of Americans formed communities that they thought would be ideal. And it's pretty much where a group of people would go together, you know, uh, like-minded people, and they would live together. Well, um, these societies represented a way for their members to withdraw from the current society rather than trying to reform it. Like, they saw that things were not going to change, so they might as well just get together and form their own community. Um, it was in these communities everyone worked together, and they shared the property and the wealth. A few examples of these utopian communities included New Harmony in Indiana, the Oneida community in New York, and the Brook Farm in Massachusetts. And even today, um, there are some out there. I know a, a very good friend, not really a very good friend, I shouldn't even say that, uh, an acquaintance, really, of mine. He lives in Ecuador, and he's got this beautiful, like, I don't know, land that he lives on, and he's, you know, grows his own food and does all kinds of things, and, you know, that's, it's wonderful for him. Um, I think I would probably like to do that, too. <laughs> Live in, like, a lot of land and have a bunch of animals, and I wouldn't eat any of them or use them for anything. I would just, like, pet them and stuff, and I'd grow my own vegetables, and, oh, that would be so cool, right? Um, that's my, I mentioned that to Mr. Meyer. I, I don't know how he's going to feel about that. I don't know. He's not too big into that either. Okay, so um, there, like I said, the utopian societies, they're not anything that's new. The last thing we're going to start talk about, and I know you guys are just so sad. You're like, oh, this video is so short. Oh, it's just amazing. All right, the last thing we're going to talk about is health care. Now, this is not the time. People did not have health insurance at this time. They couldn't go, you know, Vivian, she's got a fever. Now, some moms, most moms, Vivian is my third child, so it's a little different for me, but some moms would say, oh, we have to go bring her to the doctor and get her some, you know, whatever, and Tylenol and this, and I'm like, no, she'll, she's, she'll be fine, she's whatever. But I do have that ability to do that. If she really got very sick, I could easily take her and bring her to the hospital, the emergency room, or to the doctor. Well, back then, during the 1800s, 1850s, that was not an option for a lot of people. And in fact, most families buried at least one or two of their children. In Victorian England, early Victorian England at this time, some parents, they wouldn't even name their kids until they became like six or seven because they didn't see a point in it because a lot of babies died in their first year of life. That first year of life was the most dangerous year of a person's life. So one of the big reformers of health care in the 1800s was, no, was Clara Barton. Now, Clara Barton is well known, and she's most famous for forming, fa founding excuse me, the American Red Cross. During the Civil War, Barton began raising money to help soldiers who had been wounded. She also helped develop nursing as a skilled profession, as people, because before then, you know, women became teachers same way they became nurses you know there wasn't any kind of profession where they had to you know have a specific skills and trades and things like that you just kind of did it well clara barton um helped nursing become an actual skilled profession she rode with ambulances to the front she delivered supplies to the wounded soldiers on the battlefield stop you're not gonna meet you're freezing me and after the war, Barton founded the American Red Cross and served as the first president of the organization, which is amazing because she was a woman. So that's all I've got for you guys today. That's all of my stuff on reform. I know it's a total lot. So what I want you to do after you're watching the video, I want you to go into the course content, follow all the links, put in the code word, and then I want you to also fill out your guided notes and submit them so that I can grade them. After all that is done and you've reviewed everything and you know this, go and take American History Quiz 7, which is going to be on reform, which is everything we talked about. 
If you have any questions, please let me know. Come to small group, open session, or if you need to be invited to one. If you are missing any assignments, please complete them, but make sure that you send me information saying, Miss Meyer, I've completed it. Go check it because I won't know to check it otherwise. I hope you guys have a fabulous weekend, and our first Saints game is Sunday. Woo! Who that say they're going to beat them Saints? Who that? This is what we think about the Cowboys. What do we think about the Cowboys? Huh. Say, who that? Who that? Who that? Who that say they're going to beat them Saints? Who that? Who that? All right, give everybody five fives. Say five five. Woo! See you next time on Say the Miss Meyer Show. Say it. The Miss Meyer Show. Say it. Two. Miss Meyer. Show. 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 Bye. Bye. <laughs>